know, pra praise God for me personally. I don't spend too much time wondering what you think. If I, if I did, um, yeah, I would, I would probably be in a lot of trouble personally. But I have to tell you that I don't, I don't try to, I don't want you to think I have some preaching style because I, I don't. I, 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 if, I'm, if I'm on a bus or if I'm at Walmart or anything and, and, and God is being spoken about, it, it just starts to well in me and I get excited. But I've, I've got to tell you, with, with what I've studied, um, uh, Graham, Graham wasn't the Graham that he is now. He's, you know, 800 years old. When he was young, he was so fiery, he just, it, 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 people couldn't, ha they couldn't stand him. They couldn't stand him when he was 21, 31, and Whitfield and Edwards, and it wasn't that they would, try, they didn't have a, pre like today people try to get a preaching style. They didn't have a preaching style. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, Owen and, oh, you know, Spurgeon, who do you think Spurgeon sat there in London and said, they'll fall out thou according to with study these guys and you'll see they weren't trying to emblazon they were just nuts for God you know what I'm saying all right and what you think you think Peter's sermon in, in Acts 2 when he, Jewish people coming out at Pentecost he was like hey guys what's up man I got a message for you um we are right in the middle of, of what's called Yomim Norim, the days of awe. We're right smack in the middle between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur. They are very, very special days on God's calendar. They have yet to be fulfilled, just so you know. So if you think they, they've already been fulfilled, they're not. There will be a trumpet that will blast. And um, they will look upon him and mourn. So that, that prophecy about those two feasts have yet to be fulfilled. Um, I have to tell you, as a side note, I was sharing with Bernadette this morning as we were getting ready. I mean, you know, uh, Billy Graham's daughter has this website now, uh, ifmypeoplepray.com, and there's 400,000 people signed up. And, and I'm like, 400,000 people, that's pretty good out of 35 million. Um, but anyway, um, she's got 400,000 people signed up, and you've got this guy, um, Jim Garlow. Do you know who he is? Um, he's a pastor in San Diego, very, very big church, and he is also the director of trying to separate church and state again and trying to give the pastors back their pulpit um, because pastors won't talk about political issues. Like they won't tell you, this candidate that's running, as far as his, his feeling toward Christianity, he's a bum, don't vote for him. They won't say that, I will. Okay? Because they're waiting to get approval. They're waiting to get approval from... Uh, from, from, I guess, those who legislate. But I already have approval from, from the one who legislates. So I'm, I, I'm not waiting, but I'm glad that they're doing it. But so all, if you'll notice, a lot of very conservative groups in these last days are desperately trying to get people to come together and pray and repent. Well, if you did the feast, you'd have a day where you'd come together and repent. It's called Yom Kippur. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Please, I want you to get this, okay? If you don't get this, raise your hand, and I will talk to you personally. All this effort of signing and going and marching and calling and emailing, all this time to get a group of people, believers, to come together and pray and repent, we already have it on God's calendar. It's called Yom Kippur. Do you see the value in his holy days now? You've got 400,000 people. What if every single solitary believer, not in the United States, those were international holy days? They're not for believers in the United States, but for anybody who's attached to Israel. If you're a Christian, you're grafted, you're attached to Israel, you're part of that commonwealth, those feasts become your feasts, and then the 1.5 billion people would come before God on their face and wail and mourn and ask for his mercy. Do you think that might have an effect So you think I preach the feast so you could do something Jewish? First of all, they're not Jewish. And I don't preach the feast so you could do something Godish. I preach the feast because I know they're powerful and they bear great fruit. 
We have to get our hearts here ready. If, if people are listening and they're not interested, you might be listening today and not be interested. Somebody might have drug you here. And some of it's going to be over your head. The fact of the matter is, I've got to get my people excited about Yom Kippur. And you have to prepare your hearts for Yom Kippur. You just don't walk in Yom Kippur and go, so what are we going to do? You've got to prepare You've got to prepare yourself for Yom Kippur. And hopefully that's what we're going to help you do today. I'm going to read to you three very small sections of Scripture that Yeshua spoke. I'm very big on on what Yeshua spoke. Um, I like the great pastors and preachers of old. They're good to quote, but... If you're going to quote, if you have only one person to quote, if I were you, I'd quote Yeshua. Yeah. How's that sound? Yeah. yeah. So let's go to Matthew 7 for a minute. This is the end of his only sermon. Yeshua preached one sermon, my friend. One. He had some short teachings called parables. Parables. They're just heavenly stories with an earthly message, and they were quick. They were like drive-by teachings. You know, boom, and see ya. He had one sermon. It was called the Sermon on the Mount, and this is how he ended the sermon. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do what my Father in heaven wants. On that day, on that day, he's speaking about the day of the Lord. Now, I've heard preachers say, well, the day of the Lord, I mean, I've heard them say all kinds of crazy things. The day of the Lord entails the tribulation, and entails the second coming, and entails the millennial reign, and it entails the new heavens and new earth. It's a day is like a thousand years. It's not just, you know, at 10 o'clock this day. It's, it start, that day starts, and it won't end until we see the Father's face. You follow? It entails all these things. But he's saying on that day, when this stuff hits the fan, so to speak, he says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? It's rhetorical. You know what rhetorical means, right? He's asking a question, but the obvious answer is yes. It's like if I say to my kids, do you think I want you to clean your room? It's they, they know that it's rhetorical. Didn't we expel demons in your name? That's exciting. You ever expel a demon? It's fun, and the people throw up like bile, and it's really exciting. Didn't we perform many miracles in your name? They seem like they're doing pretty good stuff, right? They're prophesying. They're expelling demons. Yeah. That's where the rubber meets the road. The rubber meets the road in obedience. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. Believe and carry out. And that's where the rubber meets the road. But said, then I will tell them right to their face. I never knew you. Can you imagine? Get away from me, you worker of lawlessness. Let me go to the parable of the weeds and the tares. You remember that parable? It was very short. And she was saying, don't, don't be a weed whacker. Don't be a weed whacker. Be a seed sower. You're spending so much time fighting the devil, but you're not embracing God and promoting his kingdom. And, and at the end of, of that parable of the weeds and uh, the weeds and the tares some people call it tares weeds it's just different terminology it means the same thing uh, let's go to matthew 13 41 42 he says the son of man will send forth his angels again in that day and they will collect out of his kingdom all the things that cause people to sin and all the people who are far from torah to- you know what torah equals it equals the word lawlessness first john three four Is that correct? Sin is lawlessness. That's a biblical, that is an absolute, undeniable, irrefutable, unarguable definition of sin. Sin equals lawlessness or Torahlessness. Same word, Torah law, same thing. It just depends on what version you read, but they're interchangeable. They mean the same thing. That cause people to sin and all the people who are far from Torah and they will throw them into the fiery furnace. Now this is obvious where they're going. I mean, you don't have to be a theologian to know the fiery furnace is not a great place. 
okay? If Bernadette says, Dad's coming home, and when he comes home, you guys are going to wail and grind your teeth, they're not saying, oh, that's great. It's going to be a good night. Okay, this is obvious, what he's teaching, and I'll, I'll help bring it out, hopefully, and if, if you don't see the, the, the lesson or you think the lesson is incorrect, then just, you know, throw it out. Last but not least, Matthew 24, I'm just giving you one verse. Matthew 24 is where Yeshua is teaching on the end of the age. It, it's the overview. Revelation will give you details. The book of Daniel, especially chapter 9, will give you timing. This is an overview. 97 verses, Matthew 24, 25. This is called the Olivet Discourse. Why? Because he spoke and taught on the Mount of Olives right before he was ready to and get killed and ascend. He said, many people's love will grow cold. Now again, he's not speaking to the world. The world can't be apostate. By definition, you can't fall away if you've already away. You can't fall off the ladder. If you fall off a ladder and you're on the floor and I go, hey, be careful, you're going to fall off the ladder. It's like kind of closing the barn door after the horse done got out, no? In Matthew 24, listen, you have to know who he's speaking to or you will misunderstand the verses. Yeshua has not asked you to apply them on how to be a happier believer. He's asked you to understand what he's saying. Interpretation, not application. Today we want application because we're psychological believers. We want to know how it applies to us and how it could make us happy. I thought it was all about him. At least that's what I heard a lot of people say. He said, many people's body of believers love. The world does not have agapeo love. He's speaking to the body. Make no mistake. I don't care what interpretation you read. He's speaking to the body. We'll grow cold. I think a lot of people still read the King James. It's like wax cold. Whatever that means. Because of increased distance from Torah or the law. You follow? Because of lawlessness. So I've given you three sections of Scripture that Yeshua taught, and the operative word is... And the operative word is... Thank you for helping them out. Just so you know, just so you know, Matthew 24, the beginning of it, speaks about the first half of the tribulation, and then in verse 15... It picks up on the second half, the time of Jacob's great troubles. How do I know? Because it's totally in line with the abomination that caused desolation, which is the midpoint according to Daniel 9.27. Okay? So he's speaking about the tribulation in Matthew 24. This is the word lawlessness, and it is used, obviously this was written in Greek, an om ia. Okay? Can you say that? Really doesn't matter if you could say that. I, I just felt like so many pastors do that, I figured I'd do it. It doesn't matter because you don't speak Greek, do you? So it doesn't matter. But it's important to go into the word and its original language to even get a truer meaning. Because words that were interpreted from Koine Greek, ancient Greek, to modern Greek, to English, lost its meaning because there's certain idioms and colloquialisms and other things involved in a context of a language that we lose when we translate. And I know that all too well when I go overseas and they're translating from English to Telugu to who knows what. When we talk to Lombardi tribe, they have their own language. I had to go from English to Telugu, and then there had to be somebody who knew Telugu and this Lombardi language that's 4,000 years old. So I don't know what they were saying. I was just hoping he was saying, hey, you, you know, he thinks you're funny, and the next day I know I'm in a big pot. <laughs> okay, an om ia, this is the quintessential definition I'm giving you. It's the condition of without law. Why? Either because of ignoring it now. Leviticus says ignorance is no excuse. And that's also true if you're driving and you're speeding and there's no speed limit sign for a while that you saw and you say to the officer, I'm sorry, I didn't know what the speed limit was. He said, well, now you do. Here's your ticket. 
Correct? Because in our laws of our land, ignorance is no excuse. It's the same thing in God's. That's why he says nobody will have an excuse, according to Romans 1. Okay, so you can't claim ignorance. Can't. Even if you never read the Torah, you can't claim ignorance. Or open rebellion. Or I know this is wrong, I'm doing it anyway. I, just, I know it's wrong, I'm doing it. And I'm not going to stop. Oh, why don't we have signs and wonders? I love the terminology, the condition of without. I love the condition because if you're in the medical profession, when you think of the condition, you think medically, you think physical, right? They come out and say, I'm sorry, we, we did the test and you have... And everybody loves to know what their condition is so they can be labeled. And now I know what it is. I know what's wrong with me, right? And this is what I, I need to, to do to get it right. So he's saying that many will fall away in the last days. Many will say they know me in the last days. And he's going to say, we didn't know each other. Even though you claim to know me, even though you claim to love me, you were a worker of an om -ia. Now, what I love about this word is a lot of words in Greek and Latin that we used to develop English words. We used their language. What do you think this word would be translated in our English language? Just yell it out. It's okay if you're wrong. You're so wrong! <laughs> Only kidding. You know I like to kid. You know, from New York and I'm Jewish and... That's in my blood, and you just got to learn to deal with it, and I'll try to tone it down. Okay, the word is anemia. See, you miss the obvious sometimes, huh? Anemia. Now, this is the best definition I can give you after studying anemia. This is, I've just, I like to make it simple, okay? A quantitative, an amount... A quantitative deficiency, it doesn't mean a little, a lot, of hemoglobin. That's, a, that's, that's red blood cells that carry oxygen. If your red blood cells don't carry enough oxygen, you die. Okay, your heart has to pump oxygenated blood from your cardiovascular system to your organs to function as a human being. And the more oxygenated blood you have, the stronger you'll be. In fact, there's athletes that do blood doping. I had some friends in triathlons that did blood doping to increase their oxygen uptake so they had more power to bike and run and swim in the event. Of, obviously, it's illegal just like steroids, but you know they don't test in some events, and so they did it. Causing weakness, anemia causes weakness, breathlessness, and or lifelessness. Now, I just had a, a, a quickie vision, I think the Lord showed me, the great physician. Who's the great physician? Yeshua. And could you see him taking his spiritual stethoscope and putting it on your chest and saying, now breathe. And him going, oh my, you have anomia. Because a lot of people do. That's what I'm trying to tell you about the 35 million people and the 400,000 people that sign up. It's the same 400,000 people that keep signing up. It's the same people. They're the ones that are praying in intercessory and on their face before the Lord. Now, will we pick up a few? Sure. Is it good? Absolutely. You can never go wrong with asking people to come together and pray and repent. You can never go wrong. But look, I've been doing this 23 years. I know when I have prayer meetings how many people show up. I have bad news for you. You have anomia. So what is anomia in the spiritual sense? It's a lack of vigor. It's a lack of vitality. And it's a lack of power. Power doesn't come by yelling. Oh, we're going to cast it. You don't have to yell. You, don't have, you could. You could. But you don't have to. You could say, get thee behind me. You say, get behind me, Satan. In Yeshua's name. And it's not like Satan goes, you didn't yell, I'm not going. 
Got to yell. So anomia, and there's different levels, like a sprain. Some people sprain their ankle, and they're better in a day. Some people, it's, it's two years later, and the ankle still hurts. So there's different degrees of anomia. And I'm not here to put a stethoscope on you. I can't even pronounce it. I'm here to say, let the Lord do that. Examine me, O Lord. That's the prayer during these days of the whole idea is when you hear the shofar to ask God to examine you for 10 days. I can't examine you. I'm not, I'm not entitled to. I have no right to, just as you can't examine me. You have no right to. And the fact of the matter is, you don't know somebody till you live with them. Everybody puts on their little Saturday Shabbat face. I know. You're all so perky and sweet. But you ain't like that all during the week, are you? It's all right. You, 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 you're not a, an android. You're human. We get it. We're all part of the same kingdom. It's all right. I'm not being accusatory. But you've got to be honest with yourself because God sees all anyway. Don't we have to be honest with me? I'm not, you don't have to go to the priest. This isn't like a mesh screen and some, just go to God. The oil is not flowing as it could or as it should. Okay? It's not. And some of you are incredibly stressed and incredibly overworked and sadly enough, not even happy. And that's because the oil ain't flowing. It's like you're, you're spiritually stiff. Remember? Oil, can. Oil, can. He didn't have the oil. That's all. He was an empty shell. The oil will lubricate you spiritually. It will get you moving. It will give you vigor. It will give you power. And it's not a one. Oh, back in 1968... Wow, you're still working with 1968 oil? Dude, it's time to get an oil change. Now, what I believe causes the oil not to flow are three things. It's overt and it's obvious, and I'm not going to teach you anything you don't know. Sin, iniquity, and transgression. Why are they mentioned three different categories? Because they have three different categories. Otherwise, why would God say, you want to see my glory, Mo? Okay, this is my glory. I'm going to pass before you. You can only see my back, can't see my face. And this is my glory. The Lord, the Lord, full of love and mercy and compassion and long-suffering, forgiving sin for a thousand generations, iniquity and transgression. Why does he put three different categories because there are three different categories, and I'm going to go over them really quick because, you know, um, you want to go and, you know. Sin means missing the mark. Missing the mark. That's what it means, okay? That's the definition, missing the mark. Now, let me help you understand it. Let me give you my illustration. This is what I do with my kids. I make it real simple for them. It's a disconnect. It's a disconnect, okay? It's like you know when you buy an electronic device and if it doesn't work, you go to the manual and you go to the area called troubleshooting and the first thing they say is, is it plugged in? And you go, what am I, an idiot? Are you calling me an idiot, Electrolux? Hey, Panasonic, do I look like a jerk? But you know what? That's what happens to us. It's flowing. There's nothing wrong with the heavenly flow. There's nothing blocking it from heaven. It is flowing right now as we speak. But you might be acoustic, unplugged. Well how, well, how does that happen? Easy. You just start doing your own thing. It's real simple. You start doing your own thing, and you get your own ideas, and even some ministry. Some of, some of you I've seen, you have this great idea, but it's not God's. Well, let's just do it. Yeah, let's just do it. That's what we got. We got time to burn. You got time to burn, maybe. I don't. And if it ain't God, I'm not interested. We don't have time. Just, you got to get plugged in. Iniquity, it means twisting. Avon in Hebrew, twisting. It's a perversion. It's people taking the scripture even. Knowing the verses 
and perverting them by not interpreting them but applying them. Like, oh, the gifts and the calling are irrevocable. It has nothing to do with you. It's in Israel. Chapter 11 has nothing to do with you. It's speaking to Israel that his gift of salvation is irrevocable, that no matter what you say, no matter what you do, he's coming back to fight for them and save them, period. So we apply that. No, you, you shame, shame. Bad interpretation. It's out of context. It's out of context. And when text is taken out of context, it's called pretext, and pretext is nothing but a perversion. All I'm trying to do is teach you how to read and study the Bible. It might sound arrogant, but you have to do it in context. You must. No matter what another pastor, a grandmother, your father told you, you have to read the Scripture in its context. You must. The best illustration I give you is a, a simple garden hose. It's connected, right? The spigot. You got the handle. You depress it. No water comes out. Why? It's twisted. Right? And then you, you shake it because you're too lazy and you shake it and you, you hit your kid in the head with it. Right? Or well, it's wrapped around your ankle and you fall and you break your elbow and you won't admit how you did it. When people say, how'd that happen? Oh, I was fighting off some thieves that broke into my house. Really? Because that's what you go up in the air when you flick your hose. Twisted. Twisted. Do we get twisted? Yes, we pervert the scripture. Absolutely. And then transgression, that's open opposition. That's just like, that's the worst. That's like, oh yeah? So what, I'm doing it. It's a, it's a blockage. It's, it's a, the best example I can give you is atherosclerosis. Who's a doctor here? God, the only, mess, the only messianic synagogue that has no doctor. How do we accomplish that? We need more Jews! No, we need a lighter message. That's what we need. It's a blockage. Arterial sclerosis is plaque buildup in the lining of the arterial walls, right? You know what's funny about cholesterol? It could keep coming and coming and coming till that one little microscopic piece causes the heart attack and kills you. You follow what I'm saying? Listen to what I'm saying in the spiritual realm. God is not going to jump on you on a little blockage. Sometimes we get some oil, but it's just drippings. But all of a sudden, we keep messing up and screwing up and jerking around, and a little bit more cholesterol, a little bit more cholesterol, and you drop dead. That last piece, right? The straw that breaks the camel's back? It's not that straw. It was the thousand other straws. That straw just tipped the scale, not in your favor. And God is so merciful that he ain't going to jump on you as you build up. But if you don't, Get with the program, he'll go, okay, all righty. Those are overt, and everybody thinks of like the Big Ten. Well, I don't have any idols. Uh, I don't take the Lord's name in vain. You have to make a vow, and it's not, it's not what you think it is, like the GD thing. That's what we think here. That's not, if you ask any rabbi who's worth anything, it has nothing to do with that. When you take the Lord's name in vain, it's like when you say you're going to do something, you don't do it. Because you come in the name of the Lord, so you're breaking a vow to God. That's taking his name in vain. Not honoring the Shabbat. We think it's the biggies. You know, I don't murder anybody. I'm not committing adultery. Those are, those are overt. And, and I'm sure many people here, if not everybody, isn't violating those things. Right? But um, there's some covert insidious things that I want to run by you real quick, real simple. Sin is missing the mark. It's a lack of communication. It's just a lack of time spent. It's intimacy. That's why Yeshua said, you didn't know me. You're so busy doing ministry. You're so busy making a name for yourself. But you and I, we don't spend any time. I don't, who are you? You follow? Your ministry has to be an overflow of the indwelling that you get in your intimate time with the Lord. When should you do that? Not 11 o'clock at night. You are way too tired. You got nothing then. Do it first thing in the morning. Rabbi, I need my sleep. You need your God is what you need. <laughs> if you need your sleep, we'll get to bed earlier. What are you staying up late? What are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm checking this thing on the computer, this 
my idiot friend sent me another YouTube video that I have to watch that's going to have no application in my life. I love the fact that people are really careful about what they send me. <laughs> Man, I got no time. Sometimes I sit on a computer and, you know, I got no time. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and within the time I talked to her, maybe 15 minutes, I got 23 emails. And most of them were, had to be written back to. They weren't goofy, they were, you know, important. Intimacy, that's a sin. Is it, is it a huge sin? It's a, it's a sad sin. It's not, it's not malicious. But when do you spend your intimate time with the Lord? It has to be daily, man. So when do you do, oh, well, I don't have any system, I don't have a routine. You've got a routine for everything else. You've got to make a routine, man. You're not going to get close, and sadly enough, there's no moment frozen in time. So not only are you not going to get close, but you're not going to stay where you are. You're going to backpedal. It happens. It's not malicious. God's not saying, you know, I don't like you anymore. No, he loves you the same. He loves you the same. That does not change. It just, what changes for you is that, that vigor, that life, that excitement, that passion. That's what changes. And that's what you want to prevent. You want to treasure your intimate relationship with the Almighty. Iniquity, it's just not taking God as his word. It's messing around with the word of God. Well, I think this, no, no, give me scriptures to back up what you think. It's just taking the word of God as it's supposed to be taken. This is what it says. I believe it, period. You got to believe it. What else you got to go by? I mean, we're blessed with the Word of God. You see, when we hand out the Word of God to people that never had it, you should see what they do. You think you were giving somebody a pauper the Hope Diamond. They grab it, they cry, they hug it, they fall to the ground. And they would never just talk. Oh, no, that's, that's their treasured possession, the Word of God. You've got to believe it. And then transgression, the overt... It's just, I'm doing this, God, I don't care. But there's a soft rebellion. There's a soft rebellion the Lord teaches me about. It's like just doubting. Constantly doubting. That's rebellion, but it's soft. Listen to me. If, if, if you know me the way I hope you know me, and some of you don't, and is it important to know me? It's really not. You don't have to. You can come here and we can never know each other. That's not an issue. You want to know the Lord, not know me. But for you who have spent time with me, and a lot of you have spent a lot of time, we've eaten, we've talked, we've had more conversation than I've had with my whole family. You, you know that I don't want to hurt you, but the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword, and God forbid my tongue never has an edge. Because when that happens... Nothing's going to happen. So if you feel a prophetic edge, that's because God has set that up. And if you think you get a little slicing and dicing, I get it all week long. I can't come here until I get right with God. On Yom Kippur, the priest had to offer a bullock for himself before he offered one for the people. There's an order of things. I can't come here and jack around and just, well, I'll give them the message. I get the message first. I got to deal with it, and then I understand it a little better so I can share it. That's the way he works with a priest. So there's a soft rebellion. It's not like, it's not like what I'm saying, that, that utter rebellion. It's soft. And that soft rebellion is, I don't think you're going to help me out here. I think it's going to get worse. I mean, what does he have to do? to establish the fact that he's good and his mercy endures forever. What does our God have to do for you or me that he hasn't already done? How many times have you been down and out and somehow, some way, he lifted you up from the ash heap? So he'll do it again, but don't you have all these experiences? 
I mean, it's not like he said, believe in me blindly. He's got an incredible resume, and he's got wonderful references. So this trusting issue, this faith, and faith isn't like an ideology. And when it all comes down, even though I, I don't agree with certain people's doctrine, I, I just don't agree. Still, what, what enamors me is faith. People that just absolutely believe. Now, it does not make you a bad person when we struggle with faith. And I'm going to speak about that right after Yom Kippur, going into Sukkot. This is all running into one big message on how to hear God's voice, how to get drilled and filled and walk in the power of God. It's all running in because in these last days, we're going to have to hear God's voice. But we're going to have to hear it clearly and quickly, but we're going to have to walk out what we hear quickly. And that's what faith does. Faith knows. It's knowing. It's not believing. It's beyond that. It's just knowing. And we have to develop our faith. We must develop our faith. It doesn't make you a bad person. Everybody has fear. There are some people who I've met that act so super spiritual and the Lord says, watch. And then they go through something that they're believing for somebody else and they fall apart. And I don't say anything. I don't go, oh, wow, but I don't because that's not nice. I think it's a lot nicer to talk about them behind their back. No, no that wouldn't be right. Nobody does that. No, but what I'm saying is there is a measure of faith which many people have, and then there's a gift of faith, which is part of the spiritual gifts, which very few people have. I remember when I went through my ordeal, I remember saying to myself, and I wasn't trying to be nasty because Bernadette was believing for me, and I thought, golly, was it wise to get such a huge life insurance policy for her? You know, I... <laughs> Just wasn't sure how this was working out. And, um, but I didn't realize that it was more of a gifting than a measure. And then I said to the Lord, one day, just one day, you know, God forbid anything should happen to my wife, Father. But if something does happen, I'd just like to see how she handles it. And, you know, when they told us she had carcinoma melanoma, and there's no cure for that, depending on the depth, it's a death sentence. There's no chemo. There's no, nothing for it. It's, it's over. I knew a guy... In New York, a friend of mine is like unbelievable. He was the picture of health. And one day, he found that he had carcinoma melanoma. Two weeks later, dead. Dead. So I saw her have this, and I was like, whoa, this is, this is crazy, man. And, and the day that she was supposed to find out what the legitimacy, the depths of it, she, I, I was just sitting there praying and weeping and praying and I see her take off, and I go, what are you doing? It, it, aren't we early? She goes, I'm going to get a manicure. It's like, what, are you out of your mind? And it wasn't like she wanted to look good for the thing. She was at, it's a kind of a gift. It's not something she's developed. You follow what I mean? People don't develop a gift of healing. You don't develop tongues. You either got it from God or not. And if you try to develop, it ain't from him. Because a gift can only be given from the gifter. You're the giftee. You can't force the gift. So when people take you in the back room and force it, that's exactly what they're doing. Oh, Greggy. We got to wake up to the truth, man. You can't be hoodwinked. Look, I told you, Reverend Jim Jones took a bunch of them, and before you know it, they began to drink in Kool-Aid. Anybody could be deceived. Yeshua said, even the elect, those closest to me. Let me uh, finish off with a, a great prophet of God. Uh, his name is Joel, Joel. Um, and we don't know much about this prophet, which is good, because it was never about the prophets. Today, when you're a prophet, we know everything about you. Something smells fishy. 
Back then, it wasn't about the prophet. It was about the prophecy. It was never about the messenger, what he was wearing, the intellect, what school he went to, or lack thereof. There were prophets that were incredibly intelligent. There were prophets that had royal bloodline like Isaiah. And then there were prophets that had fig trees. Just a couple of fig trees and a, and a few sheep. It was never about the prophet. It was always about the prophecy. You follow? Joel is pre-exilic. You know, that means it's a fancy word. Before the exile. There were prophets before the exile like Isaiah. There were also prophets that spoke to the ten northern tribes, Israel. And there were prophets that prophesied to Judah. Okay? There were also prophets that prophet post-exile like, who would be post-exile? Daniel was in the exile. He was an exilic prophet. There were prophets that prophesied after the exile. Check. You, you, this is, it's just interesting because if you don't know what time, if they prophesied after the exile, then they couldn't be talking about when people say about the dispersed will come back, they're talking about from the four corners, not from Babylon, because they already came back if they're post-exile. So if they're post-exilic prophet, they can't be talking about the Babylonian exile. You follow it's, it, this is stuff to, it's not, it doesn't make me, I know you think, well, he's kind of smart. I'm not that smart. It doesn't take that much to find out when the prophet prophesied. It, it really doesn't. It's just, I, I like to know. God asked me questions and I don't have an answer, so I know why he's asked me questions. He wants me to know. He was a prophet to Judah, Joel, 835 to 796 B.C., okay? So we're talking 9th to the 8th century B.C., a long time ago. Prophecies are almost 3,000 years ago, okay? He was known as the Pentecost prophet. Do you know why? Because part of his prophecy in the book of Joel came to pass in Acts 2. He said, your sons and daughters will prophesy. The situation is, though, it was a partial fulfillment. There's something called a near and a far or the law of double reference in the Bible when it talks about prophecy. Part of that has come to pass, but it's child's play compared to what's coming. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's that great outpouring in Acts 2 is going to be absolutely dwarfed in this end days revival. Dwarfed. He was also called the John the Baptist of the Old Testament. You know why? Because he told the people to repent. And that's what all the prophets told the people. Repent and turn back to God. They didn't just whisper sweet nothings in their ear. No, if a prophet comes into town and they whisper a lot of sweet nothings, they get a really sweet offering. He spoke about the day of the Lord. That's what stands out in his little three-chapter prophecy. Guys, his prophecy is not long. You know what people think? Like Isaiah just would just prophesy 24-7. He would just like go, that, that challah has raisins in it, and I didn't even look at it yet. Like he, everything he said was a prophecy. <laughs> like everything he said was a prophecy. The prophets only had a small, their whole life they had like one prophecy, some of them. Do you understand? They were called prophets because God said, I want you to go to the king of Judah and say this. And that was it. That was the end of their prophecy. But the prophets today, they're prophesying all the time, aren't they? About everything, right? Oh, the Lord just told me you shouldn't have a hamburger, you should have a cheeseburger. <laughs> get, get, take a walk, buddy. You know what I'm saying? Really. Don't, 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 please. <laughs> he spoke about the day of the Lord in his prophecy. Three little chapters. Very small prophecy. And again, it includes the tribulation period, includes the second advent, the coming of Yeshua again, the millennial reign, and the finality of it all, the new heavens and the new earth. New meaning restored. Not like the earth is going to blow up and he's going to just send another earth ball and he's going to throw you on it. It's re new. It's renewed. It comes from the word chodesh, which means new moon. When the moon is renewed, it's not a new moon. It's the same moon renewed. Same moon. Let me read to you Joel 2.1. I'm just going to read you a couple of Joel and then we're gone, so. Blow the shofar in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. You know when people sing, they rush on the city, they run, and, and they're singing like this? That's not good. 
is an invasion happening. If we were invaded right now, we w- you wouldn't go, Rabbi, they're invading, they're killing me now. Oh, pound me some more, pound me some more. It's like the first time that song came out, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. Nobody knew what it was about. I don't know why. It was right out of the scriptures. So we sung, Blessed be the name he gives and ta-. Oh, it's really catchy because you're like a 12-year-old singing the song. It's about Job when his life was destroyed. Seven sons, three daughters, ten kids in a moment, dead. His livelihood, dead. His estate, dead. His health, dead. Dude, he didn't have a doctor. He had broken glass that he was scratching the sores off with. And he said in the middle of all that, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So I'd hear people sing that. I'd go, what are they, nuts? They're singing like it's a good thing. Yeah. Again, just if you take Scripture out of its context, you just lose it. Blow the shofar in Zion. A warning. The prophets came in with a warning. Sound an alarm on the Mount of Zion. Let all living in the land. Don't, don't. It's not a call to, hey, we're going to have a good time. It's a call to get the people to tremble. Tremble in Hebrew means to begin to love what God loves and to hate what he hates. For the day of the Lord is coming. And then he says, it's here. So he's giving them a chance here because he knows it's way in the future. He said, it's coming. You've got to get right. Now, why, if he knew it wasn't going to happen until who knows, like I think it's going to happen fairly soon, but I'm waiting for the peace treaty signed in Israel. When that peace treaty is signed, it's seven years. I know that because that's what Daniel tells me. So I'm, I've been waiting for the peace treaty. Waiting for the war to start so they can sign the false peace treaty. A false covenant will be made. says so in, in Daniel. So I'm just waiting for it. When I see that, it's countdown. I'm waiting for that. People say, when is it going to do? Are we already in the tribulation? I said, no. It had, peace treaty has been signed. So I'm just waiting. But he didn't know how far. But obviously his prophecy told us. Now, if they knew though, let's say he had an inkling. And he said, look. Israel's not going to be a state till like 1948 A.D. Not that he would ever say A.D. because it's Anno Domini. And he didn't know Latin. He only knew Hebrew. But anyway, <laughs> let's say he knew and he said, look, it ain't going to happen for like at least 2,000 years. So most people would go like, well, then go, go, go blow your shofar somewhere else. <laughs> don't blow it in Zion. Blow it in Chicago or something. I don't know. Why is he blowing the shofar? Because you might go before he comes. We focus a lot end days about him coming, but you also have to focus on you going. You know how many friends I've had that we were talking one day and the next day, they on their motorcycle did not make it. I mean, a lot, I'm telling you. And I knew that. I mean, literally one day I was scuba diving in Cozumel, Two days later, I was getting cut open with an aneurysm so big it had its own zip code. Just like that. You know, walking in the hospital, meeting my friend, the doctor. Hey, man, you ready? Let's go get some sushi. Oh, how you doing? Good, let's go get some sushi. Wow, did you have a good vacation? It was great, man. Come on, let's go. Hey, let me, I don't know. Let me just, let me just see if you're okay. You got, you think you got anything? Yeah, I do. I do. I think I got something right here. What is it? I don't know but I'm going to Israel, so let's, let's go get sushi. An hour later, I got that thing on my wrist, you know, and I'm calling Bernadette. And she goes, how's the sushi? I go, I don't know. <laughs> and, and she's like, what's going on? I said, I'm going to have an emergency surgery. I have an aneurysm. She said, what's that? I said, that's exactly what I said to the doctor. And she came to visit me in the hospital, and his only burn that could do, they said, uh, don't go near him. It's 12 by 8 centimeters. And she says, well, you always like to do things big, don't you? <laughs> Just when I need to marry a comedian. <laughs> Boy, you're lucky there were doctors and nurses in that room, I'll tell you what. Blow the shofar in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain, let all the living in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It's upon us. 
He's describing an enemy invasion in Israel. Now, going fast forward a little bit, because we don't have all the time, Joel 2, 12 through 14, he says, yet even now, says Anoy, he describes from 1, verse 1 to 12, the calamity. But look what he says. This is so beautiful. He said, yet even now, like right now, not next week. Now means now. Now, I'm talking to you right now, for now. Not for tomorrow, for now. Yet even now, says Adonai, turn to me with all your heart. Now that's a biggie. That's a biggie. Repentance is turning with all your, it really has to be all your heart. And if it's not, he knows and it won't be legitimate. You can't fake it till you make it. It does not work that way in the kingdom. With fasting, weeping and lamenting, why are there two different categories? If you look up those words, they're two different. Weeping is crying. Lamenting is wailing. Last night at 12 o'clock, I was lamenting so hard that I thought my head was going to explode. And I had to grab my head because I thought it was going to explode. And my hands were shaking so much, and I was lamenting. And crying, Lord, in these days, keep me. Just keep me. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. But keep me. Tear your heart. Not your garment. What's he saying? Don't let your repentance be external. He's saying, I'll know the difference. If you can't internalize it, don't do it. And turn to Shuvah. That's repentance. It's not confession. Confession is confession. It's admitting. For he, meaning God, is merciful, tender, loving, and kind, and compassionate. He's slow on the trigger. Slow on the trigger. Remember I said how the plaque builds up? He's slow on it. He'll wait and wait and wait. He's rich, abundant in favor. Abundant. In other words, he's just waiting, it says in Isaiah. The Lord is waiting for you. He can't force you, so he can, he's like, oh, great! And he rains down his grace. He, he's got it all right there. It's not like he's got to go get it. Or, or, okay, I'm going to the grace shop, and we're going to put it together. I'll be back in two days. He, he's got it right here. You follow? And he wants to pour it out, but he can't unless you want it. Because he can't force his grace upon you. He says, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. Revelation 3 is to the body of believers. It's to the church, if you will. Body of Messiah. If I will come in and we will have intimate fellowship, but I cannot force my way in. If you want to do it your way, if you want to keep going about with a soft rebellion, then there's nothing I could do except cry. And willing to change his mind. Now, you got to understand, don't confuse this. He never changes his character. God does not change. It says that in the book of what? The famous Italian prophet, Malachi? <laughs> Ma'am, you might get this when you get home. It's Malachi, Malachi, <laughs> Italian, Malachi. Let's put that one in your pocket. And... Malachi. <laughs> You'll have some for later. Malachi says the Lord doesn't change. He doesn't change his character, and this is his character. He's willing to change his mind. <sighs> what a great God. You know, us sometimes are like, nope, I am resolute about this. I have, I have made a decision. Aren't you glad that God would change his mind? So he's saying, who knows? In the, you know, Joel is now saying, hey, he might turn, change his mind, and leave a blessing behind now, you just got to pick up on this because this is not the message, but look at this. He'll leave a blessing behind. When we think of blessing, we think good, right? We think we're getting something. And they were. What were they getting? They were going to get rain in this season. They were going to get grain. And they were going to get grapes for wine to present to the Lord. See, we always think it's about us. So I'm going to get grain and, and wine, right, for me. Look, some of you still won't tithe. I can't figure it out. You'll work. You'll drive you crazy. You'll always be behind the eight ball. And you still won't tithe. Because I, I, I'm, I'm what? I'm going to rebel. That's what you're doing. 
That's all you're doing. You're supposed to give the first fruits to the Lord. Well, I don't know what you're doing with it. Well, I don't know what you're doing with it. I never asked. When we went, when we, went we would never. Because I always thought, I'm giving it to the Lord. If they mess around with it, that's between them and the Lord. <laughs> if you don't trust our leadership and our eldership here, you probably shouldn't be here. And the reason why you're not doing it is not because you don't trust us. You're cheap. You're tight-fisted. And you use your money on you. This was we would get from God. And always, whatever we get, say, first things first. Here's your cut, Lord. We're acknowledging that we would have nothing without you. He's appealing to Judah here. He's saying, please, repent. It doesn't have to go. It doesn't have to go the way of judgment. So people are saying, Rabbi, can't we repent? I'd love to see it. Yes. I don't want to teach revival. I want to see revival. I don't want to teach about the feast. I want people to embrace the feast. What's the good if you know everything about Yom Kippur, but you don't do Yom Kippur? Do you know how many revivals I've preached where people said, wow, that was amazing. No, it stunk because you didn't repent. You want to sell the tape. What do you think Graham's daughter, who's been around, man, she's seen everything. They've been around. They've met everybody. They've met every prime minister, every president, every dignitary. This guy, look, his record is stellar. I might not totally agree with his theology on some things, but his walk is stellar. And what's he say? He says the greatest ground for evangelism today is the American church. Now, I didn't say that. Graham said that. So don't get mad at me. Get mad at him. It's true. He's begging. And Joel 2.15, again, Blow the shofar in Zion. Proclaim a holy fast. Call for a solemn assembly. I'm asking you to take Wednesday off from work. I'm asking you to come here. Let me, let me share something with you Tuesday night. I need you here Wednesday. I, I think it's imperative. I don't want you to feel any guilt. I don't want anybody to say, well, you didn't come, so obviously you don't love God as much as this one. No. And if it jeopardized your job, no. 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 Maybe you can work an extra day. Maybe you could tell your boss, I'll work Sunday for this day. Uh-uh, Sunday's my day. God is doing something in our midst with this scripture. Blow a shofar in Macon. Our shofar is being blown all over the world right now as we speak. Proclaim a holy fast. Call for a solemn assembly. Do you think it's coincidence that a solemn assembly and a holy fast is called Yom Kippur and it's coming in just a couple of days? God has always worked with me and us here perfectly. We have always deferred. We are not perfect, and I am far from it, but we have deferred to God here. We have no plan of our own, but I see God's plan. He shares it with me before I share it with you, and I see him doing something in these full feasts. I have never been big on the feasts. I have actually despised teaching non-Jews about the feasts because I always felt like it was a tug of war, and I hated it. And the feast for me when I was young, I hated it all the more because there was no Yeshua, there was no spirit. It was like horrific. So my whole association with the feast is always negative. You follow? It's like if I gave you an apple as an eight-year-old and it was rotten and that's all you knew. And you bit it and it was disgusting. And then a few years later somebody said, hey, would you like an apple? By association we'd say, absolutely not. You follow? 
It's like some people, some women have relationships early on, they're horrific. And that's their association with men and vice versa. You follow because we are scripted through our experiences. My experience on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah were horrific. I couldn't wait to get out of there. Five, six hours of liturgical prayers with no message and not being fluent in Hebrew. And then I came here and it's like, I've, I've got I've to make people do this. Let them, let the, the grams and all this call for a, a holy assembly and repentance when we all, God's already done it in Leviticus 23. You follow what I'm saying? You follow what I'm saying? And there is nobody on God's green earth Nobody in the United States that loves God that would not say, we need to turn back to God here in this country. There isn't one person who I would consider a legitimate believer who could look me in the eye and go, we're doing fine. If they say that, they are absolutely hoodwinked. And they are already deceived. And they're the ones in Israel that said to Isaiah, don't prophesy to us. Get the other prophets. They prophesy illusions. Nothing changes, guys. People are people. Nothing changes. There's nothing new under the sun, right? So says Solomon. If you have something to do, you know I've never done this. You know I've never forced and said you need to come, you have to. You know I've always said come when you want. You know we don't have membership, all that stuff. I'm saying, after hearing what we shared today, I would like to implement it. I feel God's doing something. I've never been excited about the full feast like I am now. If I'm wrong, my apologies. But I'm excited because I legitimately think God wants to do something. He's just waiting for a people to take the lead. I've always felt this place was special because I always felt the people were special. I never felt the place was special because of the place. I always felt it was the personnel. Be special. Be different. Don't sell out. Be sold out. Don't blend in. Stand out. I hope and pray that you'll take Yom Kippur this year. Seriously. For those that it means nothing, please don't. Don't come and try to get excited. Don't. It's okay. And I won't know which one. I don't look around. I don't even know if you're here. You'll call me during the week and say, hey, Rabbi, I said hello to you. I go, really? I don't even, I don't even know you're here. Because, because I try not to, you know, just let it fade. I'm not, you're here, you're not here. That's between you and God. You follow it, so we've got to do it with me. You're not here for me, you're here for God. That's what I'm here for. I'm not here for you, I'm here for God. You come for God, I come for God, we glorify him, and that's what he shows up, and then we're happy. Right? So if there's a way... I know that people will be here Tuesday night because it doesn't encroach. Wednesday, it's a little bit of a sacrifice, right? You might have to take a personal day. You know if you've got something important to do that you want to do, you take those personal days, don't you? I'm saying I think it's important. And if it ends up not being important, I am utterly sorry. But I have to go with what I feel I'm being led. Amen? Amen. Okay. Um, you guys, why don't you, I, I never know how to do this. How are you supposed to do this? Tell me the, 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 the seminarian way to call up the praise and worship. Oh, how about, how about this? Will the, will the worship ministers please come up and bless us with another? This is a lovely day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it. How does that sound? Oh. Let's stand up together. Um, again, tomorrow... 11 o'clock, which is 5 o'clock Israel time. If you would say that prayer, it will take you about 18 seconds, if that long. Don't think it's silly. I think it's incredible and powerful. Um, I hope and pray that you have a, a grandiose day. Um, I was going to say something. Are you guys going to sing something, right? We can. Yeah. I was going to say something. Let, 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 let's... Um, Break the hands from it. You know why? Because if they sing a song, that's kind of weird. So, it's okay for some. Yeah, it's, and it's a little too kung by Irish, and, and that bothers me because there's so many different men of God who have held hands and sung in the name of the Lord, and they weren't singing in the name of my Lord. So, anyway, I think it's important to sing a song, 
and then let me do the benediction. Because after the benediction, then it's kind of it's kind of over, right? And then the song, you follow? Mm-hmm. So let's do that. And um, while they're getting ready, I, I hope you have a fantastic weekend. I mean that. And I hope that you focus on one thing, just loving the socks off whoever you're with. Your, your, your family, your wife, your husband, just love them. Do the right thing. Your kids, just love them. Just love them. If you come in contact with people you don't know, love them. Bury them. Heap hot coals of love on their head. Because that's what we're about. Really. And I know that's what you're about. So don't let a prophetic edge teaching cause you to go, wow, am I the one that I'm going to hear, you know, depart from me? I don't know. I don't think so at all. I'm just, I'm just keeping you in the game because the road's going to get a little rocky. You follow what I'm saying? You know, I get on a lot of planes and when there's a turbulence, I watch people lose it. And I'm like, the plane is flimsy, man. The winds are strong. We'll be okay. We'll be okay. But there's going to be a lot of turbulence. But I'm telling you, the landing is going to be like a butterfly touching down with sore feet. The line of Judah is getting ready to roar with a sha'ag. It's going to make the MGM Grand Lion sound like a domestic cat. He's coming for his bride, which is us. He's coming to declare war on his wife's enemies. And he's coming to kick the East Gate in and rule and reign in his third temple. When I ask people how things are going and they say it's all good, I think it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But when he comes and somebody asks you, how's it going? You're going to be able to say, it's all good. It's all good. I'm grateful, very grateful. I just uh, feel and I just heard from our Father that he really enjoyed our worship today. We, we really worshiped him. And um, I'm so grateful that we pleased him, truly. So just, just leave here. If nothing else, um, just know you made Daddy happy. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Shalom.